Hey there, class. Um, it occurs to me that you guys might need a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, extra help with the idea of evolution and uh, organizing your thoughts around ev evolutionary mechanisms and things. And that's understandable. It's a pretty complex topic, but it is very important. Um, it's important for many reasons. Um, one of which is it'll show up again and again in your education from here on out, certainly as you move on to uh, upper division work in biology. It's expected that you thoroughly know the mechanisms of evolution. And as you move on and take things like the MCAT exam often has a few questions about evolutionary mechanisms and things like GREs for sure have uh, an emphasis in your understanding of evolutionary mechanisms. So it's really good to have a good foundation of it. So that's one of the reasons why um, I've assigned you sort of building this study guide for evolutionary mechanisms. But we wanna take it a little beyond the, the usual and it's pretty hard to understand like where do you put these? And part of the challenge really is for you to figure that out and come up with a way, perhaps a new way to organize these, um, these mechanisms. So let me uh, share with you uh, a screen and um, we're going to do um, a little bit of uh, sort of PowerPointy like uh, discussion, and see if this can uh, we can elucidate some of the some of the issues. So um, here, let me share my screen with you. So there we are. Okay, and um, we're going to do this sort of PowerPoint style. And um, so we're, our intention here is to put the mechanisms of evolution in some sort of context. So first we start with a real general thing. And I know this is a, it's kind of one of those funny jokes where you're like, oh, so where do you start when you're studying biology? And first you have to understand what life is. And I know it seems like you might know that. And it's typically in the first chapter of every textbook, but I would like to perhaps challenge your ideas on that and give you some new, a new perspective. First of all, um, the uh, life is, is kind of a, it's not like this fundamental unit of life is a cell and cells reproduce and metabolize, etc. Um, I want to consider life from a larger perspective. And first of all, life is um, something that's uh, an ordered enterprise that is, it's negatively entropic and that it's structured in order and, and it has, has, has complexity to it that is maintained throughout time. And, and that would be sort of the, uh, the negative entropy part of this. This is a description, this graph is a description of the entire universe um, where entropy is on the um, y-axis going up and time is on the x-axis from left to right. Right, so we would be out here on the far right of that axis, and through time, entropy is increasing. For those of you who've taken physics, you might understand that that is the second law of thermodynamics. Um, so there's always a question: is well, where does order come from? If if entropy must increase over time in the universe, why do things tend to get more ordered through time, as well? Well, that this graph explains that the order, the negative entropy and the information contained in them, that is the structure of the, of the, of the items themselves, um, are increasing as the actual entropy is increasing. In fact, as uh, you'll see in a moment, I would argue that the negative entropy actually creates the actual entropy, and thus these two are related in some fashion. And so that together they drive the entropy to increase in the universe with sort of a temporary negatively entropic state. Anyway, so as long as you understand that the negative, our entropy is increasing over time, uh, but negative entropy is part of that system as well. And that's where life happens. Um, so let's see. We also know that life dissipates energy. So it occurs in a gradient of energy. So wherever there's some energy, potential energy stored or free energy, life is possible. That is a structure that dissipates that energy source can, can um, originate. Um, and the order of that system, that is the structure and the order of that system is dependent upon the dissipation of that energy. And by dissipating the energy, you create entropy. So this little, little sort of graphic explains that, um, that things are not in total equilibrium. There's a, a sort of a balance that goes on as the free energy or the energy source is available. Um, 
And then some sort of system will develop to, uh, to drive the entropy down, right? To create a structure, if you will, that might contain information. Um, and then that will, will create a capacity to do work and through that work, generate the increase of entropy that loops us back around. So over time, if you were to balance these equations, the entropy overall is increasing and temporarily decreasing by way of, of creating a system that does that. The other thing about life that's, uh, that's unique or that's, that's you should know <laughs> is that it occurs um, mathematically at sort of this edge of chaos. That is, if you have a system that's completely ordered, that it's always the same, it's completely predictable, that, that tends not to continue. In fact, that sort of system um, obtains this state and then sort of just sits there. Um, and you can't really have life occurring in a state where nothing changes. In fact, there really is no state where nothing changes. Um, the, the entire universe, as mentioned just before, <laughs> is increasing in entropy over time. And, and so as you move through these, the, these states, um, going from order to utter chaos, which isn't exactly randomness, <laughs> but kind of random, like things couldn't, you couldn't hold things together over here. There's too many parts, too many moving parts to replicate. Um, you know, lots of, this is not where life can really, you know, uh, sustain itself. But as you back into it, there's a place where there's just enough order and just enough creativity to create a system that can continue. And so in mathematics, there's a whole like um, chaos complexity mathematics that really describes this edge. And you expect it to be very complex. In fact, as complex as you can be before local um, constraints cause the system to collapse. So there's always this like pushing the boundary of complexity uh, in living systems. So another, another aspect to living systems is that they form complex adaptive systems sometimes just abbreviated CAS. And these systems are um, the, the sort of mm, rules, if you will, within um, one of these edge of chaos uh, systems. It's pushing um, the level of complexity, increasing uh, entropy outside of it, um, but somehow maintains this weird state of order um, within. And um, they're often, often very uh, intricate and they have particular rules that they follow. Um, and, and it's an interesting study all on its own, the idea of a complex adaptive system. They're often generated, by the way, in iterative recursive um, systems. And iterative means it repeats like a process, like reproduction. Sexual reproduction, for example, is iterative. It happens again and every generation again and again. And it's also recursive in that it happens on the, um, the states from before. So like you reproduce and you produce your offspring, which are a slight modification of you and your genetic material and information. So, so there's an iterative repeating and recursive back on itself. Uh, process that, that sort of keeps these systems going. Anyways, you could do a whole study on the complex adaptive system and their structures um, that they generate. Um, life is also a cognitive system. And to, what I mean by that is that it takes information from the environment, um, some sort of uh, signaling that gets transduced, which means converted into a a signal that's readable by the system. And then it's integrated often with some sort of memory um, to produce some sort of action, which changes the environment, which is then transduced and then is integrated and around and around it goes. And we think of these as like intelligent systems. Um, and when I say intelligence, you might think, oh, well, you need to have a brain to be intelligent, et cetera, but that's not at all true. Um, there are many, many different systems that, that obtain a certain ability to improve or maintain themselves over time and solve problems. And so uh, a recent example you may have seen in the news 
um, often they'll use uh, slime molds as an example of an intelligent cognitive system which doesn't have any nervous system at all that uses instead other aspects of it, the environment and their biochemistry to, uh, to develop systems that solve problems. And they, they can create really amazing structures uh, and solve all kinds of puzzles. Um, as can you, you use a neural pathway as your, your modality. But all of life um, is generally a cognitive system as well. So an example of one of these types of systems would be like a trophic web, a trophic structure in a community um, where you have producers and consumers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, um, detritivores, which would be the decomposers of the system, and all of these parts, this whole system follows all of those um, attributes that we just talked about. Um, for example, the, um, the generation of entropy if I use that as an example, a uh, trophic structure here on the left, this is sort of the trophic web, which by the way, I'd like you to make for your, uh, for your aquatic systems in your experiments. Um, if, I, if I organize it differently into a food pyramid, if you will, a trophic ziggurat, actually, if you were using a proper architectural term. Um, and what the, the ziggurat part of it is, is the, the sort of mass if you will, at each level. And it's pretty well known that there are more plants than there are consumers, primary consumers, and more of them than there are, you know, secondary consumers, et cetera. Um, and, you know, <laughs> maybe you didn't really think about this too much, but um, what's really going on here is that each level above, so the primary consumers eating the producers, um, they have to eat about 10 times their biomass essentially about 10 times their biomass per annual, so per, per year, uh, to maintain themselves. So if a moose weighs a thousand pounds, then it has to eat 10,000 pounds of plant material. Okay, so if there were no upper consumers here, then, um, then that would put less um, pressure on the producers. That is, they could grow slower, there could be fewer of them, but as soon as you add consumers that start eating them, if you will, at a certain rate, um, then you have to make more of these. And this relationship is directly causing um, entropy, right? So if you think of my tissue or this moose's tissue as, uh, as order, right? So here's this thousand pound moose of ordered material. To maintain it, it has to export 10,000 pounds, if you will, of entropy. That is destruction of ordered material at the next lower level. So every time you add a, uh, a level of consumer, by tenfold, you're increasing the entropy generation over time, right? And the more large predators you have that are maybe tertiary or even higher consumers, this is a, um, terrestrial food web and terrestrial food webs tend to have just like four or five steps. Marine food, step, food webs could have like 11 or 12 steps. And when you do that, you're really amplifying the entropy production potential. Okay, so um, the, another thing about these systems is that there tends to be um, odd <laughs> connections and cooperations. So in this case, um, matter always just cycles around. All the different elements, all of the different molecular components cycle around. They don't really you know, increase or decrease too much over time, especially at the elemental level. Not at all, right? All the carbon that's ever been here is still here doing its thing. Um, however, they link up in these um, uh, cycles. Um, we call them biogeochemical cycles, and, and each one um, forms a little like cycle, like it changes from one thing to another thing to another thing, and then back around again. And these cycles tend to unite to form more complex systems. So within um, biological systems, you have a lot of these different biogeochemical cycles coming together to make the systems that we're talking about. So this is a simple example here of a carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen cycle. 
um, they can be, they get more complex. <laughs> I can't even diagram, even begin to diagram the complexity of the biogeochemistry of even the simplest system. But it really quickly adds up. This one includes some, uh, the sulfur cycle, along with the carbon cycle and some of the nitrogen cycle. And these are typically carried out by different microbial communities. Um, but you and I and plants and everything else participate in these as well. So all living things participate in these systems. And the thing that makes them go round and round are the energy gradients. And as they go round and round, they generate entropy. So, um, so the, all of the fundamental principles of life are carried out through these systems. Um, one bit of evidence for this is um, the biperiodic um, climate system on the planet. By biperiodic, I mean that it kind of has two states. It's a two-state system, the climate is. This is looking at the climate through time. Um, and if you go back 4.6 billion years, it goes from hot. And then, um, then there's this first glacial period. Then it goes cold, and then hot, and then cold, and then hot cold, hot, cold, hot, 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 cold down, right? So hot and cold. It's got a hot house, greenhouse, or which would be like a greenhouse climate and an ice house climate. Um, and it goes back and forth between those two states, but it stays pretty darn stable. Um, for 4 billion years, it's been pretty stable in those two states. Um, and that's an artifact of these um, biogeochemical cycles and, and the system. Now I mentioned that over time, these things um, generate entro more entropy, they dissipate more energy, and yet these cycles tend to remain fairly homeostatic. It's an interesting um, paradox really uh, in the system to be both homeostatic and positively entropic over time. Okay, so um, if these systems <laughs> uh, actually were working, you would expect life to do something. Now, you may have heard <laughs> way back in, in the first chapter of, uh, of reading your Campbell textbook that there is no direction to evolution. It just sort of, you know, sort of meanders along through random processes and natural selection. Um, but all the evidence <laughs> points to no, that's not true at all. It has gotten, life has gotten much more complex over time. It generates more entropy over time. Um, it, 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 it takes care of more energy flow through time. So you can look over here. This is probably from your textbook. And if you go back in time, you know, to say 1.8 billion years ago, you start, you see these uh, bacterial fossils. Right. So from 3.85 billion years to literally 600 million years ago, which is like, you know, three and a half billion years, you have microbial communities developing, doing the biogeochemistry. But the actual forms of life, very small, right? They're, they're, um, they're tiny microbial um, bodies. And then right about, well, actually, it's, it's right around 1.6 billion years ago, you have the first eukaryotic cells, single cells um, emerging, but still one cells or you know small colonial cells. And then you have this explosion at about 600 million years ago of animals, multi, truly multicellular organisms with high complexity and, and, and trophic levels explode. You go from you know just having producers and decomposers to producers and consumers which as you know, as soon as you add consumers, you add a tenfold at least increase in the, uh, the um, rate of entropy generation and the rate of energy dissipation. And so um, you have this pattern through time. I mean, imagine when you start off with these small, you know, arthropods and things might be eating each other and some mollusks and very simple, um, organisms, many of them quite small, nothing really larger than you. Um, and then you go through time, uh, say up to the Mesozoic period, and you have dinosaurs running around. <laughs> I mean, these things are giant and, and voracious. You know, there's nothing more voracious than a 32 ton, <laughs> 32 ton Tyrannosaurus rex, right? It has to eat 320 tons of 
um, herbivorous dinosaur, which then has to eat <laughs> 30,000 tons of plant material. I mean, this is a, a massively flowing system, dissipating great deals of energy and generating huge amounts of entropy. So by the time you hit the Mesozoic, things are in full stride. Just to give you a, a, a sort of, if you go further forward through time, the giant mammals of our recent past were doing the same thing. And then if you went to say right now, <laughs> humans have sort of taken over with their economies and our economies generate even more entropy, orders of magnitude more entropy. And we um, dissipate orders of magnitude more energy than all the biological systems that came before us. So we're actually fitting right into this pattern of increasing those things through time. Just in case you wanted to know. Anyway, so now you finally are wondering, I'm sure, like, why? What does this have to do with evolution? <laughs> Okay, so that was all the motive force behind it, like what's causing evolution. Uh, evolution is obviously pushed by the past and it's pulled by the future and it's, it's very, um, it sits in the middle. And what we're looking at is the mechanisms of change. What causes these changes which we can track through these motive forces? And so um, the evolutionary mechanisms are these creative means. To, to do this change over time. And you know, you can you can kind of explore um, like this diagram is just showing, you know, how you go from fishes to terrestrial vertebrates in limb evolution. And these are sort of gradual changes in structure over time. But that's only one way that evolution works, and that doesn't even tell you really how it's working. Um, one thing that evolution does is it moves from what is happening or what is present, that's the actual part here. Um, these little gray containers would be like, say, species right now. Huh? And then these open chambers would be the ones that are like, well, these are potential. Like, where can you go from here? And, and to go from species that exist today to species that are possible, right, the next possible species, you have these lines and these lines the green lines with the red arrows on them. These are the mechanisms that are generating. That. So it's, there are different mechanisms that can lead away from any state now to move to other states. Anyways, um, there's a, a theoretical biologist named Stuart Kaufman. Um, <laughs> if, if you're really into some really dense and heavy theoretical stuff, I would say read all of his books. <laughs> He's an amazing theorist. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say no more about him. Anyways, he has this idea of the adjacent possible, which is tracking evolution like at the state where it's happening from here to the very next state. Now, it doesn't just happen on this open canvas where anything that could possibly happen does. There are a few other attributes of the environment that kind of constrain um, what evolution can do. And we, we use a term called fitness. Okay, so the little graph on the right here um, on the y-axis would be fitness. <laughs> so these little peaks are areas where we have higher fitness and the valleys have lower fitness. And fitness, by the way, um, can be measured in many ways, but the traditional way to measure fitness is the number of offspring you, live, you leave that reproduce. So your offspring is that reproduce. So the more offspring you leave that reproduce, uh, the higher your fitness. That's only one way to measure it. Uh, it's not about like how many sit-ups you can do or something like that. Anyhow, so evolutionary fitness, or if you were looking at genes, this would be the number of uh, copies of a gene that are passed on to the next generation, another way to measure fitness. Um, but then you might wonder, well, what are these other parameters, right? What's the, what's the, the Y, or I'm sorry, the X and the Z axis? And these could be all kinds of different things. This is a representation um, in a three-dimensional graph of a multi-dimensional hyperspace. <laughs> that is um, you and your behaviors and all of your genes and how they behave and all of your physical attributes and how they behave, all of them you know, add and subtract from your fitness. Um, we couldn't possibly visualize a graph that showed a separate axis for each one of those things. Um, so we're, we're sort of constrained to a three-dimensional graph. 
Um, but hopefully you can use your imagination to expand this. Um, we can mathematically model these beyond, but we just can't graph them. It's a, a limitation of the human mind. So keep that in mind as you're going along. Anyhow, so uh, if you imagine the little circles over here on this graph um, is like a place where an organism might be at one state of its evolution. And then it would move at, through an evolutionary mechanism to another state and another state. And theoretically, um, organisms would follow these lines. You would move to another state when it increased your fitness, or at least didn't, didn't, didn't decrease it too much. So you could go from you know one state to another state, and that's okay. And then you and then you go to another state with a higher fitness, and that's better. And then you climb these peaks, if you will, um, these sort of peaks on the fitness landscape. So all the mechanisms of evolution are really about how you navigate a fitness landscape. How do you get around? Now you may notice on this landscape there are some jumps <laughs> from peak to peak or from the top of one peak to the slope of another peak when you move up. And one might guess that there are evolutionary mechanisms that differ in these different places, right? Some, some are long distance jumps. <laughs> there are evolutionary mechanisms for the long distance jump on the landscape. And then there are mechanisms for the short iterative little movements that might refine you up a peak. So when you're looking at your evolutionary mechanisms, you might consider how they're allowing you to move around on the landscape. And with some of these really low points, these valleys, if you will, in the landscape, these are places where you would be naturally selected against, right? So the creative process of evolution might generate an enormous variety of things, but only, um, only those that fall on the landscape where there's some positive fitness uh, will survive. So that's um, not a creative, but a reductive process. So evolution has mechanisms that generate novelty, are creative, and others that are reductive and eliminate some of the possibilities. So you might consider that as we move forward. Um, this process, this sort of iterative recursive process, oops, sorry, jumped ahead. Um, was first sort of figured out by Charles Darwin. And you know, he realized that there's this like variety that's produced. Um, there's only so many resources, so only certain ones would survive. And he called those that survived the more fit. And um, he realized that if he ran that process through time, that is added a, a time axis to it, you would end up with these branching trees. And this is actually the first phylogenetic tree uh, sort of ever sketched out, and it was in Darwin's notebook, just like you have a notebook, right, where you might have genius ideas that'll change the future of all biology. Anyways, this is, and, and I like that he wrote, I think, like, hmm, I wonder if that's possible. Well, it was. Anyhow, uh, the same tree, if you look at it today, um, is this, this is the more modern, the most modern, most recent version of the tree of life, um, which is an expansion of Darwin's idea. Um, and uh, one thing you might note about this tree, by the way, this is all the variety of life, um, probably at about the phylum or kingdom level, actually, uh, not the species level. It would look much more complex than that. Um, but all of this stuff up here at the top and all of this stuff down here on the left side of the lower branch, um, all of those are bacteria. I'm sorry, these up here are all bacteria in the domain bacteria. These down here are all in the domain archaea, but are also of that simple cell type. And this little teeny green branch over here <laughs> is all the eukaryotes. That's all the protists and you and me and all the plants and the fungi and all those things all in one little branch. So if you look at the diversity of life on the planet, by far and away, most of it is microbial. And all of the biogeochemical cycles. If you were to take off this branch, like take your pruners out and clip all eukaryotes, and we all went extinct tomorrow, and all that was left was microbes, all of the biogeochemical cycles on the planet would be fine. It would just continue. The atmosphere would stay within its boundaries. The uh, carbon cycle would run nicely. The nitrogen cycle would be perfectly balanced. Everything would be fine. The only thing this eukaryotic branch does 
is accelerate everything. It makes the carbon cycle run faster. It makes the nitrogen cycle run faster. It, uh, it makes the entropic generation increase. I don't know if that's interesting to you, but as you add branches, some branches add whole unique functions, but others are simply accelerators. So moving on. Um, if we were to look at the, uh, your textbook, you would get this idea. Hey, look, I'll just sit up right up here next to this guy. And uh, you would just get these basic um, five mechanisms of evolution. By the way, this is Julian Huxley. He wrote the modern synthesis of evolution. Um, like in the 1950s. <laughs> and it's the same one we use today. So obviously it needs an update and that might be part of what you're going to do here. But anyhow, so uh, over here on the five mechanisms, uh, you have mutation, gene flow, um, non-random mating, which leads to sexual selection, natural selection and genetic drift. You may note, and I've certainly noted, there's only one of these that's actually creative. <laughs> mutation is the only thing that creates novelty here. And it says that specifically is random changes in DNA sequence. That's it. Everything else here is reductive, <laughs> right? Gene flow, a few genes make it over here. Non-random mating, right? So your sexual selection, certain alleles are picked, the others discarded. Natural selection, some survive, some do not. It's reductive. Genetic drift, if you have a catastrophe or something, you're blown off course and now there's only a few alleles make it, reductive again. So they have four mechanisms of reductive, like take down whatever you're created and uh, make less, and only one of them that generates novelty. And I think they're missing some really important parts to this system. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so I wouldn't even call these five all the same. Only one of these generates anything new, and the rest of them just sort of select that. And I think that's kind of a, a simplistic version of how evolution might work. Anyhow, I would make sure you know these, however. <laughs> Most of your future um, uh, encounters with people asking you about evolution are gonna involve these five. But let's move on and see if there's something maybe more, more interesting going on. And I would suggest there is. Um, and the first round of this uh, attempt to make things more interesting is called the extended evolutionary synthesis. And it has a whole number of different um, mechanisms that it, it would like to add to that little batch of five uh, to, to give a more complex version of the creative process of evolution. And so let me just kind of pop through a few of these uh, just to, oh wait, oops. Wow, look at that. Oh, that is the next one. Okay, here we are. This is uh, endosymbiosis, serial endosymbiosis on the left. This large diagram kind of shows the mechanism in action. Right? And endosymbiosis is simply the recombination of different cell parts and types. You take one cell, fuse it with another cell, and then they recombine and form new parts. Um, sometimes cells become entire organelles. And then that can happen over and over again in a lineage. So you have one cell and another cell and another cell and that and another cell and that to create all of the different um, eukaryotic lineages that we know. Every single one of them created in this fashion. You might notice up here, there's a little, a little side branch for all plants that come from green algae, phylum chlorophyta. Um, there's the red algae that come out of that, another branch of the same process. Um, there's a, yet another branch that you don't even see here, which would go on to form the opisticonts, which you come from. So these processes, this is only the algae. These are only the photosynthetic organisms that are protists, let alone all of the um, protozoan organisms. So this is a highly complex, very um, diverse uh, mechanism, and it generates novelty. This is not a reductive process. This is a true generation of novelty or a creative process. Um, and it creates structure, and it, these are, it creates entirely new functions. You go from being um, a, a, a heterotroph to being an autotroph, like boom. And it, in, in minutes, not, not like years or centuries or millennia, it's like instantly you're a whole new organism. Or maybe you couldn't move before and all of a sudden you have a flagella, like 10 minutes later. So um, these are giant leaps across the fitness landscape. 
This is like jumping from one peak to potential others. When you jump, of course, you don't know where you're going. So you might jump into a valley and that's that. That's natural selection. But in this case, um, the, the potential for creativity is immense. Um, serial endosymbiosis is probably one of the most creative processes in evolution. And it's, it's in your textbook, but oddly not mentioned under evolutionary mechanisms. Weird. Um, developmental plasticity. Um, this is something you're measuring in your plant, um, in your plant uh, climate experiment. Here's an example from animals. These are grasshopper species that if you grow them individually and isolated, they come out kind of green matching the environment. And if you grow them in giant crowds, they come out aposomatic color, reds and yellows, and they, they with more high contrast coloration. Same genotype expresses very differently depending on the environment you put it in. Now, that's fine. That's, that's the definition of uh, developmental plasticity. And the idea would be that these different forms are adaptive. They're not just different, but they're adaptive to their particular instances. So in a crowd, it's good to look poisonous and dangerous. Whereas if you're isolated, it's good to blend in. And so these are both adaptive structures. Now, if you run that same idea through time, so here we are, let's say we have this um, organism that randomly produces or plastically produces different phenotypes. In this case, it's um, the asymmetry of claws in a crab. So let's say this crab species produces asymmetrical claws on the right and the left. Now, if one of these has an advantage over time, maybe through mate selection, for example, um, then over time, the genes that produce the other variant will be lost. And the genes that produce this variant will be um, cemented in place in a process called genetic assimilation. And then the species will shift in that direction. So if we went back, say, to the grasshopper example, if they were always in crowds and, and there were no isolated individuals, any green individuals that were accidentally produced would be selected against. And over time, the genes that produce that color would be lost. And all you would have would be the, a, a, um, would be the brightly colored, high contrast individuals. And that process is called genetic assimilation. Um, Multi-level selection is something that's not even thought about, um, and that is natural selection, if you will, that occurs um, at these cooperative units that come up away from the genes and individuals. We think of natural selection as occurring at the level of the individual, or maybe, depending on who you are, if you're Richard Dawkins, it happens at the level of the gene. Um, if you're E.O. Wilson, it happens at the level of the individual. But you know, very few people in any textbook would suggest that it happens at the level of group or population, or I would suggest above this, even community. Whole communities can be selected for or against depending on their level of cooperation and the benefit that cooperation brings them. And so the where selection occurs. Now, is this process creative in a way? more than regular natural selection. If you take natural selection in genes or individuals, you take the variety that's produced and you remove some, it's reductive. But once you start thinking of this as being a process where groups can get together, same species groups or multi-species groups, then you start um, de developing cooperative things that come together to form um, assemblages that weren't there before. So then it becomes a creative process um, at these higher levels. Um, and obviously I would argue that these uh, uh, bringing things together in new combinations as a creative process is more important from an evolutionary standpoint than the reductive processes of natural selection. Okay, um, finally, that last one I'll leave you with here is the uh, niche construction, the idea that organisms can modify their environment through time and create environments that facilitate them and their ancestors uh, to survive. So coral reefs, every one of these individual corals leaves behind a skeleton, which the other corals build on. And eventually it changes the current patterns, creates habitat for other things that are associated to live with it. And something like the Great Barrier Reef, for example, is a niche constructed by, by generations over hundreds of thousands of years to generate this giant structure 
which completely changes the way the ocean currents flow to facilitate their survivorship and, and feeding and everything. So they constructed their own um, environment that they pass on to the next generation. And in doing so, um, their, this, this sort of niche that they've constructed is, um, is a strategy that's evolutionary, right? It's creative in a way, creates things that weren't there before for natural selection and other systems to operate on. So, um, oh, sorry, there was one more, the queens. <laughs> um, there's a set of mechanisms um, that are named after um, characters of different types. The um, white queen, queen and the red queen, by the way, come from, uh, from through the looking glass. Um, and <laughs> it's the Alice in Wonder story. Um, you should read the whole book first and then explore the two queens. <laughs> oh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, it's a fabulous, these are fabulous ideas. Um, there's another one called the Black Queen, uh, by the way, that's not related to the Alice in Wonderland story. It's related to a uh, card game. Uh, we won't go over that one at this point, but the, uh, the idea of the Red Queen hypothesis, really briefly, is that as one organism evolves, say like a gazelle evolves to be run faster to get away from its predator, say the cheetah, then that drives the cheetah to come up with uh, an ability to run faster. Now, if it doesn't, that's fine. But if the cheetah then, the faster cheetahs can catch the faster gazelles, and, and those two start evolving in that direction, each one gets faster and faster and faster through time. And that's a red queen scenario. Um, and the, the cheetah gazelle thing, pretty easy to understand, um, but it could also be something like, um, for example, you might have one group of organisms that starts reproducing faster, right? Say it's a consumer like rabbits or something. And they start reproducing faster and faster, which is a great thing. Do you think that would move you up on the fitness deal? But if you consume all of the plants you depend upon, then that's not so great. But then if the plants can reproduce faster to keep up with the rabbits reproducing faster, then the whole system over time increases or you know, in, in speed of reproduction, which then correlates in this case to the speed of entropy generation and uh, energy dissipation. So the Red Queen hypothesis would explain, if you will, these larger patterns that we talked about at the very beginning of this short enterprise, where we talked about how uh, entropy increases over time and so does uh, energy dissipations in living system. Um, right, oh yes, yeah. so now we're sort of at the end, last little bits to leave you with. Um, you should think about when you're looking at these mechanisms, are they creative processes? Do they generate novelty, new things? Or are they reductive processes? Do they pick among the novel things? Um, you might think about how are they inherited? Where is their memory stored? For instance, a coral reef, its memory is stored in its structure. <laughs> the memory of the coral reef is the coral reef. However, uh, uh, something like um, if you come up with a new enzyme, right? If a new enzyme evolves because you change a protein, the gene for a protein slightly, um, then the memory of that is stored in the DNA, right? Um, and that's how it's passed on. Whereas the coral reef is passed on because the structure lasts beyond the life of the individual. So there are all kinds of examples of where you have things where there are memories um, or information stored that's not genetic, but yet it is inherited and passed on. Epigenetics is a really good example of that, uh, just as another possibility. Um, so the idea of things leading to novelty, are you really creating new things in this mechanism? Like really new things? Like the de novo gene hypothesis, for example? Um, or are you just sort of recombining old things? Maybe endosymbiosis is really just the, you know, the recombination of old things to create new things. Um, how big on the adaptive, how big of a leap on the adaptive landscape does it afford? I mean, this, is this like endosymbiosis where you go from not movable to movable, from heterotroph to autotroph? Or um, is it subtle, like I'm a little bit faster now um, in the case of, say, the gazelle cheetah hypothesis? So, you know, some, some mechanisms move you around the landscape at different rates. Um, 
And then finally, how would you organize these into a truly modern synthesis? Not the, the old, you know, five mechanism thing you read about in your textbook, and maybe beyond the, um, the, 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 you know, some of the more modern extended uh, syntheses. Maybe you could come up with a better way to organize this. And that's where sort of the revolutionary thinking happens. And that's kind of what I'm hoping that maybe one of you will do. <laughs> come up with a totally new way to organize these things into a completely new uh, theory of evolution that, that is a little bit better at describing what's really happening in the world. Anyways, um, I hope that was somewhat useful and gives you some better context for what you're thinking about in this assignment. Um, anyways, uh, hope, hope that helps. Ha, 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 ha.